I'm sure this is a topic that many people have wondered about, including myself for quite a while. It took uh, quite a lot of information and research to figure out exactly what you need to do for a Renex to HO swap. Everybody's done it. No one tells you about it. <laughs> the basics behind a Renex to HO. First off, what's Renex? Well, Renex is the ECU and the fuel injection system made by Renault and Bendix. So that is available from 87 to 90 Jeeps. And the newer stuff is uh, just Chrysler ECU stuff. So when you're going from Renex to HO, the HO is the high output ones because with the mods that they did, it made a little more horsepower. What's the big hoo-ha between the horsepower and whatnot? Well, with your older Renex heads, uh, I forget the number exactly, it's a 28 something something. Um, they had lower intake ports or something, so it wasn't exactly a straight shot. So with the newer heads, um, it's a higher intake port, it's a straighter shot, and they actually flow much better on a flow bench. So that's the important part. You can get more air in more efficiently. So the head is like the major component here. That is the big part of the swap. So what you're going to want is a 7120 head, which is the best head. That'll be from years 91 to 95. Or if you can find it, a 0630 head is basically the same exact thing. It just might be missing the coolant temperature sensor. Now I have a 0630 head, but it came out of a 96. So it has the temperature sensor in the back. If you look back here, That doodad over there. Well, that's what you're looking for. So if not, you can either use a new thermostat housing to adapt some stuff, or um, you could drill and tap your own hole into the head if you want. I found out you don't need the valve cover. You can reuse your old valve cover on the new head. Uh, all the heads will fit on all the blocks, no problem. There shouldn't be any issues. It's between the intake and the exhaust because ports changed and whatnot. The other thing that you can do, which helps with a lot of power, uh, the last head on the XJs was a 0331 uh, head. Now that's pretty close to the other heads, except it has smaller exhaust ports so that they warm up faster. Now that doesn't help with flow. So what Chrysler did to uh, negate the uh, loss of power is they made a curved intake runner. So this one's all curvy and round. There's no square holes or anything. So this flows a whole lot more better. So with the combination of the 7120 head and the 99 up intake runner, you get a whole lot more power with none of the, um, the bad things, which is cool. Some people said they've seen up to 20 more horsepower out of the swap. So, you know, that might be worth it to you. Then give it a shot. You're not going to see anything crazy, but you might notice it being smoother, maybe a little more all-around power. So what do you need for the swap? Well, here's the list I came up with. So all the blocks are the same for the most part. It might be some different bolt holes, this, that, and the other, but same stuff. For the cylinder head, like I said before, your 7120 is the best. Uh, a 630 is the same exact thing for the most part. Um, just make sure to check if it's got coolant temp sensor in the back. For your intake runner, 99 to 01 off of an XJ should do fine. I think some of the other ones, maybe Grand Cherokees and possibly TJs, might have the curved intakes after that year as well. For the throttle body, I actually like the 96 to 01 throttle bodies better because they have the map uh, hole. But if you can, a, a 91 to 95 is the same. The difference in throttle bodies is also something you could convert your Renix one but you'd probably want to bore it out for the most uh, use because the Renex one I think was like a 51 millimeter bore and the newer ones are like a 60 millimeter bore so you get more air. Oh, you also need a TPS adapter um, to adapt the Renex TPS to the high output throttle body. Now that uh, is a longer process that will be covered in another video. Uh, your fuel rails and lines aren't going to work so you're going to want a 91 to 95 fuel rail that way it bolts to the um, the 99 intake, but the 91 and 95 has an in and an out port. The uh, newer ones only had an import, so that's why the 91 and 95 is important. Along with that, you'll need to lengthen your hoses and get some quick disconnects. Uh, accelerator cables. The 91 to 95 accelerator cable is the longest and the best, but a 96 to 01, it's only slightly shorter and it'll still do the job just fine. Uh, if you have an automatic transmission, you'll need a 91 to 01 trans kickdown cable. That's a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, along with the intake, you're going to want the, um, the throttle body cable brackets. So, you know, just this little metal hoopley doo dah that bolts on top. So don't forget that guy. Uh, for exhaust, you can use a 91 to 99 exhaust manifold. You will also need the front pipe. 
because your old pipe isn't even close and it uh, the newer ones have the O2 bung in the pipe instead of the manifold. You can also get a header and there's a lot of options for you now because you're in the 91 to 99 range. Uh, you'll need the power steering pump and the mounting bracket pulley assembly off a 96 to 01 Cherokee. So that is just this little black metal bracket here with this adjuster and this pulley. So you'll want the pulley assembly, you need the bolt, and you need the thing in the back for it to all work. And the pump is basically just the same old pump, it's just a little different, I'll go over that later. Now because of the power steering pump where it is, you'll also need a different size belt. Um, and you'll also need the airbox cover and tube off of a 91 to 01. If you notice with this airbox, you get a port here instead of here, and this one comes out at more of an angle, and you also need the rubber tube to fit onto the body. So that should be just about everything. I was able to reuse my uh, vacuum lines. One more thing. If you are in a state that requires all your emission stuff to be intact, you'll have to do a bit more than I did. You will also have to delete your EGR valve. Now, I just took off the uh, the solenoid over here and the valve because obviously there's no spot for it to fit. Uh, if you need to do that, you'll have to weld a uh, something into the exhaust and you'll have to make a tube and figure out some EGR setup. There's one unused vacuum port, so you could run the exhaust in there if you needed to, but you'd have to do some more trickery than I. So good luck. So, let's go look at some differences and stuff, eh? Okay, so over here you can see the old intake from the Renix. Smooth, flat, square. Very different from this curvy round one. So, for exhaust and intake, this right here, nice eBay special, this is 105 bucks with shipping from eBay. The seller was Speed Daddy. It's a 91 to 95 exhaust manifold. It's got a inch and a half primary tubes and a two and a quarter outlet, so it'll fit on your stock uh, system. So, but when I when I go to the exhaust shop, I'm gonna have them step it up from two and a quarter to two and a half because I need that flow. All right, exhaust manifold is on. I could reuse my old washer and nut from the uh, the old Renix head. So, this is on. So, now you just put the intake on, right? You just you put it on there and it bolts and it fits right up, right? That looks good, doesn't it? Fuck no. So, it's got some uh, some dowel pins in there to hold it in place, which is nice. You notice the top that you can see? Nice and flush, very nice. But, it ain't level. No siree. You go, oh, well, that's no big deal, right? Wrong, motherfucker. Very wrong. Look at that gap. A lot of people put the 99 intake on for the first time, start it up and go, man, I got a really high idle, I don't know what's going on. It's because you have a major fucking vacuum leak there, dum-dum. Something that most people don't fucking tell you for some reason is that you got to grind some of the 99 intake down to fit around the 91 to 99 exhaust stuff. <sighs> this is why test fitting is important. <clears throat> Alright, so here we are at the bench. Test fitting everything. This is our uh, Renix head, but everything will bolt up. The intake ports just don't line up and whatnot. So here I have the intake flat now. So the intake is flat and the exhaust is the one that rocks. See here, there's a tinkin'. Hmm, something stinking. Our main concern over here is exhaust port six. Clear contact. Quite a bit of it too. A lot of people were having problems with the cheaper APN headers because of this exact problem. So, how's that go? You get what you pay for, right? Got a bunch of junk garbage. So we can do two things here. We can grind out the intake runner until it fits. Try and beat the pipe down a little bit or, I don't know, a little bit of both. But we see our fitment issue, so we can fix that. Or, you know, you can decide on whether you'd like an intake leak or an exhaust leak. <laughs> Okay, we grind it a little off the head, we beat the exhaust down a little bit, I tried squeezing it with some big old clamps and other stuff, beat it with a hammer, and we got it pretty close, and then we dremeled the rest off. So now it sits all the way flat, and there's a gap there now. 
Cool. Easy way to tell. Come over here. Sits flush and no tappy noise. No tappy tap. Cool. Alright, now we can bolt it back on. Quick tip. If you are trying to get these bottom bolts in, you can put them in before you put the intake on, but you can only thread them in just enough that they're there. They have to be like just barely in there, and you'll have enough movement to go down and in. So you got four of them. They're a little tricky to get to. Now we can put the intake on and get to the top ones easy, and know the bottom ones are at least in. Okay, so now if you notice, not only does it say flat, it actually sits down a little bit. So now you know we got plenty of room. So to give you a better reference, now you can see that it's sitting perpendicular. Okay, now I can put the rest of them get the bullets in. With the Renix head, uh, the all the exhaust um, bolting surfaces were studs. On this one, the top one does not exist. So you'll have to make sure that you grab at least one bolt from your uh, junkyard head. I grabbed all of them just in case. So you'll need one more bolt than what you did previously. And you'll have a nut left over. So now we can tighten them in that crisscross pattern to 25 foot-pounds. So another problem with the Renix uh, system adapting to the new intake is that the power steering pump no longer bolts up properly because the old mounting style is just different. So as you'll see, there's a pretty big gap here. Because that hits the intake. So, we have to switch to the new style adapter. So this is it right here. Now the way that this works is it bolts to the uh, the power, or the, uh, it bolts to the water pump just fine, like that. I don't know if it goes in the front or the back. No, it definitely goes in the front. So it bolts on there like that. And then the power steering pump is sandwiched between these two plates. Now the cool thing with this system is you can reach this uh, pulley there and this will be your new belt tensioner. So instead of dicking around the power steering pump to get it to tilt the way you need it, now this thing just brings the pulley up and down. It's a whole lot easier. You don't have to remove the airbox to do it either. So I am kind of happy about this. One of the things is the power steering pump and you're going, well why? They look damn near identical. They both got a bottle on there, and a pulley, and three bolt holes, and an import and an out port. Everything's basically the same. And you're right, they are basically the same. And if you'll notice, the old pump even bolts up to the, old, uh, to the new bracket. But here's the problem. It's all wiggly wobbly. Well, why is that, you say? Well, like I said, the, um, the older pumps because of this wacko bracketry design here, it didn't go all the way through. So the pump itself is threaded. So the bolts only go about this far in, and it's threaded. So you could use your old pump. All you have to do is drill out those threads, and it should go all the way through. And then this one over here just, it doesn't have two ears on it. But it would work, it would fit. The only thing is, you notice that the um, the reservoir is at more of a steep angle, so it might be more likely to uh, leak fluid. Where this one, it um, it sits up just a little straighter, not by much, but enough. <laughs> so uh, the cool thing is, if you really want to be on the cheap side and keep your old pump assembly, just drill out the uh, the threads, and uh, she'll thread right in. So I was having a problem where I tried loosening this fitting and instead of loosening the one joint, it loosened the other one because there's actually two fittings on here. There's one fitting that threads into the power steering pump and then the other one is the fitting that sits on the end of the pipe. And by loosening this one, it actually broke this one free first before the actual fitting. So I couldn't get a wrench in here, and I thought, oh, great, I'm going to have to take the frickin' pulley off and all kinds of bullshit. But then I remembered, hey, you can take the frickin' reservoir off real easy. It's got two of these little slide clips. You just have to put a flathead here and lift up and wedge something underneath to keep it from going back down, and then just pull it out. And once those clips come out, the uh, reservoir just pulls right out the side. 
It's only held in with one little tube and one little O-ring. Well, I mean, I guess that's maybe not a little O-ring, but you get the point. For reference, you want the, uh, the wrenches set up like this. So that way when you squeeze on them together like this, it loosens that top fitting. All right, now we can switch the hoses over and swap over the uh, pump. Okay, there you go. Power steering pump installed. Just in there solid. You want to make sure that this bracket's loose <coughs> because it has a little bit of wiggle room. And you're just going to turn the pump and put your bolts in. And they run through the bracket, through the pump, and into the manifold. And I put a little anti-seize on there because they were a bitch to get out at the junkyard. So that's my new motto. If they were a pain in the ass to take out, I'm going to put some anti-seize on them when I put them back in. So... And then once this is nice and tight, then you can tighten these guys and you're set. Cool. Oh, in case you guys are curious, that's what the lines look like at the back. This one, instead of the, the pipe coming out here, it comes out in the back. So I just have it looping around in the back now. And it's fine. If anything, there's a little less tension on it now. Not bad. Okay, so our belt routing is going to change because of uh, our different pulley design here. So, interesting thing, we can get rid of this idler pulley. I'm going to take this idler pulley out because I know it's good. I'm going to swap it in here for that junkyard one because it was just a little warm and I like the sound of it. Okay, so here's the diagrams. They're not perfectly drawn to scale because <laughs> it's difficult to do. But here is the original Renix uh, belt routing. So, as you can see, the water pump and the crankshaft were kind of connected and it just kind of loop de duped around. Here's the newer one. It looks like a big old like W or you know a V or something like that. So it just kind of goes boinka boinka boinka. Real simple, real easy to figure out. Okay, now comes the time to measure the belt. Now this is going to be a custom application for me. Uh, for you, you might be able to get away with one of the newer style Cherokee belts. I don't know. I'm just going to measure because <laughs> mine ain't stock. So the way that I do it, I get a hundred foot uh, flexi wrap uh, measuring tape and uh, you know just wrap it along the belt line and this has got a little clip here so it sticks up a little but that's good because that leaves you a little bit of room to actually put the belt on with this water pump here this will be the part that it slips on so as you check the measurement we're looking at six feet two and a half inches so six times 12 72 so you get 74 and a half we're gonna need a 74 and a half inch belt now, if you go to the auto parts store, they're going to ask you for your, you know, year make and model. <laughs> that doesn't apply here. So you're going to have to be a big boy and tell them the part number. So this is the belt that I got here. This is the uh, Suricana standard size. 50 is something. 60 is something. I think that might be the ribs, the six count, because there's six ribs. And then here is 74 and a half inches. I think 50 is the type of belt that it is. Now, there's another type of measurement where it'll be like 6 PK and 6 is the rib count, and then it'll be 7, 4, 5. And then that would be your belt size. Now, if there's four numbers instead, then that means it's in metric. So you'd have to convert your inches to millimeters. And I forget what it is, but it's like a... I'm totally off, but it's like a 1340 or something like that. But it'd be like a 6 PK, 1340. But that's how you figure out your custom belt size. And make sure that your idler is as low as it can go, because you want all that um, you want all that slack. So that way you leave yourself some room for stretch. So I'm gonna put this belt on and show you the fit. Okay, with everything put on there and the belt tensioner as low as it can go, take our belt and she just slides on there. Whew. And you can see that there's about that much adjustment there until she gets tight, and it's going to be obviously a little tighter than that. So this has a full two inches of belt travel. So if it's 74 and a half, it could take up to as much as 76 and a half inches of belt, which is cool. So there you go. I would definitely recommend uh, ordering from somewhere nearby so you can return the belt if it doesn't fit because it's going to be a pain in the ass to keep sending one back for shipping and all that crap. So yeah, now we know what belt we need. Yay!
So something interesting to note when uh, putting the belt on, uh, I finally got a, um, a belt that I was happy with and it worked well. But then uh, I bought another one because I like the Gatorbacks. They're really cool. It looks like Gatorback, uh, the Goodyear Gatorbacks, were bought out by a company called Continental. So now you're going to look at a Continental Poly V belt with Quiet Channel technology. So it's a Continental Elite. So I had to go slightly bigger than my old one. My old one was a 74 and a half, and I bought a 74 and a half Continental, but it was too tight; it wouldn't fit. So I bought a 75. A 74.7 might have been a little better, because now that I'm really cranking it down, if you notice, it's contacting this thing down here. So I'm not quite sure what that is, but uh, if you have to use the upper half of your uh, idler pulley to tighten your belt, you're going to have to grind that down so your belt doesn't contact that. Get one of these guys. These... This will take down the metal real fast because it's a light aluminum. And then if you want to polish it and make it, you know, smooth, use a little grinding uh, stone or something like that. It's a pain in the ass to get down there and grind it, but it is clearing. So I am comfortable running that now. It's much better than it was. And the belt is nice and tight, even on like this end over here. I know Cherokees like tight belts. So just for mock-up purposes, here's the Renix fuel rail sitting on the uh, 99 plus intake. And as you can tell, she don't line up for shit. <laughs> the, Ren the, the Renix intake mounts parallel while the, uh, the 91 and up ones mount at like a 45 degree angle. So you'd have to figure out <laughs> A lot of things. Clearance wise it's not terrible but um, there's not really any mounting position so you'd have to like make some kind of funky I don't know how you'd make a bracket to connect the two. I wouldn't exactly want to drill into the intake but uh, <laughs> I don't know, unless you got a lot of time or if you feel like cutting down the brackets and you know making your own stuff it's not going to be an easy install, so I guess it'll just be easier to uh, adapt fuel lines than it would be to adapt a fuel rail. Alright, for the fuel rail, check your donor one for O-rings. Make sure to take them out before you put your new ones in. So we're going to fish them out with a little pick tool. It's a lot easier one with two hands, but... Ta-da! Fresh coat of paint will make anything look good. All right, so those injectors in. We're gonna lube them up with a little bit of WD and pop them into the rail. All right, fuel injectors are in. So, lubing up both ends, you just kind of wiggle them back and forth and slowly push them in. If you're feeling a lot of resistance, stop. Make sure everything's lubed and you know you're going in proper because you don't want to cut up those little O-ring seals. It's gonna to suck to take this whole fuel rail apart just to replace one of those O-rings. So, now we're gonna do the same on the other side. We're gonna make sure that. All these ports are clean and uh, lube them up and then we'll push the whole rail in. There you have it. Fuel rail installed. Very nice. And bolted down as well. And now you just gotta run your dingy do feely lines. Remember which ones are which. That zip tie that I put on there is for the feed line. So that means the other one's the return line. I'm assuming that the smaller line that's directly connected to the fuel pressure regulator is the return, so, yeah. Okay, so, we're, we have to adapt the fuel lines. Uh, if you were to get the 91 to 95 fuel lines off of an XJ, I think it has to be a four-door. I, I might have read somewhere that the two doors might even be different. But uh, you'd need the two lines, and the problem is they don't just disconnect at the back. They use nylon that goes into something else, into metal later. So you'd have to get the, the fuel rails that go along the whole frame rail to the fuel pump. But we're going to adapt our lines, so I cut the lines. They're just rubber, and we're going to use rubber fuel line to go into our fuel rail. One size is 5 16 in the fuel rail, and one size is 3 8 in the fuel rail. Both our old fuel lines are 5 16 so it's a bit of a pain in the ass. I was trying to find adapters, and I just couldn't find anything that was working. So we have ourselves a 5 16 barb here. Alright, once it's all said and done, you should have a connection that looks like this. Almost hard to tell. 
Now these are special uh, clamps that are meant for fuel lines. If you notice, it's a full band and it gives more contact. It's a better seal. These little doohickey fuel injection hose clumps. And that's all they are. And just squeeze a little tighter. I found some uh, connectors online, steel body, and they are the quick disconnect. So I got a 5 16 and a 3 8. Now, the cool thing is the 3 8 comes down to a 5 16 line. So I don't have to do, use this adapter down here anymore. It was a little loose and I wasn't super happy with it. So now we can just use a 5 16 to 5 16 and use this connector and de haw. Well, if you've ever wanted to know what's inside these stupid little things, <laughs> You got your O-ring set up there with what looks like some kind of plastic washer or something. The rest of it's just a hollow body. You got yourself a little clip ring thing. And then over top of that you have a plastic isolator that holds it all together. I had to take this apart because one of the stupid tabs was bent the wrong direction and it wouldn't work. So now we can snap this all back in here. Now it's all together again properly. Check this out. I might have to push it a little harder. The other one went on easier, <laughs> but that's about it. Then we can slip our hose over top, tighten her down. All right, got our 5 16 barb in there, and we got our connectors all set up. Looking good. If you want to know what the part number are for those, the first one is 800-120 for the 5 16 adapter. And the other one is 800-121 for the 3 ace adapter. It seems to work fine. Okay, so the first sensor that can get moved over is the manifold uh, air temperature sensor. This guy on the Renix manifold. It was towards the back, way over here. Okay, so I'm messing around with the intake now that it's on the vehicle. Luckily, Chrysler is consistent. And it looks like both these holes have the same thread pitch. So I'm going to take the sensor and mount it back here so it's closer to the wires. And by doing that, we shouldn't have to extend them. And now, with this guy pointed over here, oof, it's a tight fit. But if you pull the wires out of the harness a bit, she'll be fine. All right, that's one problem taken care of. And we can move this vacuum line here, or we can put a different fitting in if we need something smaller. All right, next up on the easy list is gonna be your idle air control valve. So this little guy right here is that such thing. It sits in here, pops out with uh, two Torx bolts. Size T20. And that'll just pop into here. You're going to want to make sure to grab your O-ring. Or if you got a new one, put a new O-ring in there. So O-ring. And then this guy will just pop in here. And you'll use the bolts for this throttle body. Which are these little guys right here. I'd say our TPS adapter is a go. All right. Only cost us six bucks. Nice. The uh, there's a difference in um, accelerator cable length and um, and your transmission kickdown cable length or you know throttle valve cable whatever the hell you'd like to call it. But um, the newer style is a lot longer because of where it has to go on the engine. Now, obviously there's nothing in here right now, but you can see how short my uh, my Renix one is or my Renix one. Uh, it attaches to a a bracket here that goes up and down and that'll mess around with the throttle. Um, so this one isn't gonna work for our application because it would have to wrap around a lot farther. Coming underneath the dash, under this mess of everything that I've got going on here that I'm gonna clean up at some point. Your gas pedal's right here. And if you follow the, uh, the linkage all the way up, you're gonna be looking for the, uh, the thing that fits up there. This guy right here. So there's a collar that has to come off that you push through the front and then you can just pull it out over the top of the pedal. So once the pedal's free, then you got two clips up here that you gotta squeeze and push and that'll push the cable through. 
So you can see the difference. <laughs> the newer style on the top is much longer because it's got a loop around the engine. So it's got to go a little farther, but whatever, if it works, you know. You get the idea. The new one actually goes a little farther. So your gas pedal will go down a little bit more. So now I got this big long cable that's going to loop around and look something like this now. It's annoying that it gets on the valve cover and everything, but whatever, it's part of the swap. Deal with it. The throttle valve cable for the transmission. Here's where it mounts to in the uh, the transmission. It's just held on there with, uh, I think, a 10 millimeter bolt. It's Asian, so it's probably metric. And then up here, this is the clip that it's held on with. It'll be on the right side, and it's a pain in the ass, but all you gotta do is pull it to the right real hard, and it'll get up and under that clip. If it's still in, there's probably no way in hell you're gonna get to this bolt. So just pull on it really hard and it should slip under. Uh, this will also be connected to one of the breather hoses with some plastic ties. Uh, and you might not be able to get to them either, so good luck either trying to cut them, or you slip them off. It actually has a quick uh, disconnect thing on it, so you pull this back, this little tab at the top, and then you can actually pull the thing through. So it's like a non-permanent zip tie, but you have to be able to get to them to do that. Once that's done, it's all free, so I'm doing this before transmission goes back up so we can uh, replace that valve a lot easier. Alright, in order to put the uh, that thing in, we got to drop the pan and drain the fluid. If you're lucky enough to have a drain bolt, well, drain the fluid before you, you know, get splattered with the stuff. First step on the transmission is going to be taking all the bolts out of the pan. There's quite a lot of them. They're all 10 millimeter. Keep one at the front and one at the back that's easily accessible. And then slowly drop the back one. And see if the uh, gasket splits. If it does split, make sure you get your drain and your pan ready. Take the back bolt out first so the pan tilts back and that'll get a whole lot more of the fluid out. So you're not splashing all over your face. Alright. Pan's been removed. Now if your dipstick hasn't been removed in quite a while, it might not want to come off. That o-ring might get a little stubborn. So you might have to wrestle with it, but that's where it splits. You don't have to totally remove the pan though, but now would also be a good time to change your filter if uh, you haven't done that in a while. So, now that we're inside, if we come up top, that's the top of the cable. That's the bottom of it. See this little cam assembly here? It's a pain in the ass. But if you got a flathead or something, you stick a flathead in there and pull this cam back, and then you gotta get that little wire out of there. So you're gonna pull the cam back and slip the wire up and over, and then you should be able to pull it out. But this is two handed tricky work, so I'll just have to show you what it looks like when it pops out. Okay, flathead and a pick will do you well here. So you take the, the flathead and you pry the, the cam back and then you can get this wire out so what you're doing is pulling the wire over and what you gotta do is slide it so it'll come out so it has to be vertical so the the, the cable will slip out of that hole it's hard to show you because it's way up there now but now the cable's free, so now we can unscrew that bolt and pull it out, and then we'll put our new one in. We can take our new one and slide it in and connect it to the can. Oh man, if you thought taking that thing out was hard, just wait till you gotta put it back in. We're talking like level 2 rocket surgery here. So I have this pick very carefully holding that cam, and it's under a lot of spring pressure, so quickest little slip and that thing is back where it needs to be. But, you have to rotate the cable, you, you have to make the cable do a U-turn so you can slide the thing in to the right, because it doesn't just pop, it has to slide in, and then it's locked into place. So, we gently let this thing explode. Okay. Locked in. <laughs> That's what we're after. Now she's riding where she should be. <laughs> All right, now I can tighten that bolt down and uh, put the pan back on. Okay, now that you put that cable in, don't forget to adjust it on the throttle valve end. So you push this button down 
And while you're doing that, there's going to be a big long thing in here. You push that in as far as it goes. And then what you do is you either step on the pedal or you can do this outside. But you just pull this all the way open until all the clicking stops. It's a little hard to do. It might be easier to just step on it on the pedal. But you keep doing that and that adjusts your throttle valve cable properly. So. <coughs> Okay, so now we got the wiring harness set up and everything. We got the injectors on with uh, their clips. I can't tell you the exact order of them. I just know that where my where my wires sit, you can just tell where each one's went. I marked them when I first took them off years ago, and some of the white paint even stuck. You got like number one, number three. Oh. Some of the other ones faded. Um, for the TPS sensor and the uh, idle air control valve, I had to run the wires through the back, back here and underneath everything. Uh, the idle air control valve I actually had to flip over so that the harness had enough slack in it to connect. So that's connected. This one's fine. The wires are long enough. You can just run them wherever. Along with the wires, don't forget your heat shield, which is this thing back here. It's just like basically some kind of foil and it's got some mat underneath. Make sure to grab that from the junkyard. That's very important because it keeps the exhaust heat down instead of up. So if you forget that, you're going to start melting those wires that you ran over here. So make sure you put that heat shield in there. <laughs> it's kind of important. Let's go right there, this uh, t intake temperature sensor. That one just barely fits. It's, it's almost under tension. That's <laughs> almost a bad thing. And the zip tie's on here because the uh, snap broke a while ago. And if it weren't for this zip tie, this thing would come right off after the first wiggle bump or whatever. And the rest of the sensors run down here next to the fuel lines and go underneath. So now that that's basically done, all we got to do is figure out uh, vacuum lines. And I do believe we are solid. Okay, I think I got everything figured out vacuum wise and I was able to reuse all my old hoses. They were just repurposed. So we'll start at the front. We have our vacuum for the, uh, the fuel pressure regulator. So I found a small fitting on one end, with a long wire, and I ran it down here. Um, next up, we have our CCV, our crankcase ventilation. This is the sucking part. So I just reused the old fitting on the old intake that was located here, and just used the hose into the stock location, and she fits fine. Next up is the MAP sensor. This is actually, I would prefer the 96 and up throttle body because it has this map sensor, because you want the map sensor to be at the throttle body. So I reused um, just a, a regular hose. I actually took one of the ends off and found a long section with a big one here, because this is a big fitting, well, bigger, I guess. So I found a big fitting that went here, and then it just went, uh, this is the, the rubber that came with the throttle body, and I just stuck it in there. And what else, what else? Underneath, this is for the vacuum ball for the heater control valve. So that wire just, or that vacuum hose goes over there. And then the last one, the fresh air vent, I just cut the hose that I had so it'll fit the new box. You need the new air box lid. You can't use the old lid because it, it doesn't come out at the same angle. You can use the bottom half of your air box, but you need the top and the hose. Uh, as for electrical, our engine to body ground, this guy right here, there was an unused bolt, and I just ran it in there. So, I think our intake is solid. Nice. Alright, <clears throat> hooking that uh, canister up to the intake here was not a good idea. Big vacuum leak. So I got this plug for now just for testing purposes. And I have this running to a T in the air box now, so this is only getting air box vacuum or pressure that goes to the engine, so that's nothing. Alright, we'll finish that vacuum line off properly with a uh, vacuum cap. I don't know what size it is, but they look like this. And they're rubber, they're a little thicker than the, uh, the vinyl ones you can get. So, now it's sealed up nice and proper. Nice. Looks a little better. <laughs> cool. I think that finishes the Renix to HO swap. As long as this is working properly, I feel like now this is sucking the wrong direction and I don't know. I'll have to look into it. 
All right, now it's time to try and put the exhaust in. This is the hard part. Now, we can totally 100% ask this if we have to. I just need it to be on there enough so that uh, I can take it to the exhaust shop tomorrow. So if you notice, this one comes out at quite an angle. We're talking like a solid 45 degrees. And the one from stock barely has any angle at all. 10, maybe 15. It's, it's at a huge angle. So trying to mate them up is gonna be a pain in the ass. And second off, that new manifold does not have an O2 sensor bung uh, in the, uh, the body, because the newer ones, they switch to the front. So if you can, you're gonna wanna buy a front pipe for the newer Cherokees to fit with the manifold. <laughs> I don't have that, and I'm not going to buy one because I'm getting two and a half inch exhaust. So I'm gonna see if I can't hammer the absolute ever-living shit out of this thing to get it to even closely bolt up. Hell, I even stuff a bunch of putty in there if it means getting around for a day. And uh, then we'll figure out how to rig an O2 sensor into this. Fuck this exhaust. Oh man, so we got the back hooked up, we got the front hooked up. Now first off, I couldn't get the pipe through. That pissed me off. I wasn't dropping the cross member again. So I cut the fucking pipe. And then it was too long to figure out what I was going to do up here, so then I cut the fucking pipe. And then I had to dick around with the flange and bend it all around until I finally got something that was halfway like a seal. Definitely not 100%, but much better than it was. And then I cut a little bit off this piece here and made an L to connect the two. And I'm using scrap exhaust that's bigger to hold it all together. <laughs> So I guess I'll have to clamp it or do something to hold it in place. It just has to make it 30 minutes down the pike to an exhaust shop. I ain't too worried about pretty. <laughs> just the get her done factor. Now we also got to put an O2 sensor in here somehow. That's going to be exciting. Okay, this is getting a bit more involved than I was hoping for. <laughs> Drilled a 5 8 hole and that part fits in good and the threads you know they're where they should be but they won't grab i don't have a tap that big it just ain't working <laughs> so we're gonna have to weld in a nut that fits there I'm gonna make our own custom bung just to get us to the fucking shop oh man the amount of effort i put into dumb shit holy cow that's tightened up the eye so i guess it mates enough <laughs> Hopefully it don't leak terribly. We got our O2 sensor in. It looks very different. This is a Bosch. I, uh, I don't know, it looks unlike anything I've ever seen before, but it's got the right connector on it, so. All right, so that is the final product for a Renex to HO with a 99 plus intake swap. <laughs> it was a bit of a hassle tracking down all the parts and all this, that, and the other thing, but we got it. She done. So it's all together. The TPS uh, sensor adapter that I made works awesome. I'm really happy with it. It's easy to adjust and it works like a charm. Thing is sweet. And you know, everything else is good. Didn't really have to extend any wires. Got the uh, oxygen sensor down there. Now we have an actual exhaust. So she's looking good. Oxygen sensor and whatnot. So yeah, <laughs> when you, uh, Make sure that you get a 91 and up uh, tail uh, front pipe, or you will be there forever <laughs> trying to beat that thing into submission. It's going to leak all over the place, and just ugh, don't do it. Get a front pipe if you're sticking with uh, stock exhaust. But there you have it. I'll see if I can't make up a proper list for everything you need, but it is possible. And, you know, it's hard to tell because I, I installed this with the stroker, but it seems like it runs fine. Plenty of air. Does the job. So, yeah. There you have it. Run next to HO swap.